Absolutely. So when you think about your level, when you're creating something like a platformer, for example, you want to think about, uh, first of all, optimization, right? I always like to start low uh, when it comes to environment stuff and then kind of pick and choose my details, uh, and re which is different from characters. Characters, you kind of want to go high and then go low. Um, I like to start low and then go high because it just gives me a good baseline to kind of white wall out an environment and kind of just prototype something quick and dirty but have it make sense, right? Um, also, if you're doing a mobile game, it's good to start low too because you're just going to have good optimization and then from there you can kind of pick and choose your battles or just keep adding stuff onto it to kind of give it more detail. Um, so with that being said, if we take a look at um, the project, in here you'll notice that we have a bunch of different platforms, right? So we wanted to do a platformer, and so I kind of went crazy with platforms, and we have all kinds of different ones. We have straightaways, we've got curved platforms, we've got little wobbly paths, we have these kind of stacked structures, um, even these little like jumping areas that are all kind of stacked, all kind of different. But the beauty of what I did with every single one of these and a great way to kind of initially prototype a lot of pieces that you can use for your own levels is every single one of these pieces is basically using the exact same texture, okay? And you wanna get into the habit of doing that and that's basically a really good kind of initial fundamental learning for optimization for your games, right? So yeah, we looks like we have all these different pieces and every single one of them has a path and whatever, right? But they're all using the same texture and let me show you what I did with my texture. So Every texture is like a paintbrush. Yeah, exactly. So in Photoshop, right, I started with kind of my uh, 1024 by 1024 piece of artwork. That's my, my canvas, right? Um, and then from there, I divided it in half, a 512 by 512. Uh, I thought about my platforms and how they were going to be constructed and repeated. And so the right side of my artwork, which would be this side right here, is the top path that you would run on. Right, And so if I created a structure and I UV mapped this part to the top of my path as I repeated and made that you know particular object longer or shorter or whatever, I know I can repeat this indefinitely in the Y axis and it's always going to match up, right? So what I did was I made sure that the bottom and the top in Photoshop using your polar coordinates, you went in and basically I have stitched this so it repeats forever, right? I did the same on the side right here. So if I think about my objects, and we'll actually go into Maya so I can give you a better idea of what I'm talking about here. But here's my simple object, right? You'll notice from this texture, if I can pull it up here on the side so you can see it, right? Just real quick, because I know we're kind of running short on time. Yeah. I don't want to derail you too much here. When you create a repeating texture like that, how do, you, how do you make sure that your edges line up? Okay, good question, actually. In Photoshop, um, I just go, it's uh, Filter Offset Edges. Right, and uh, so if you're using 1024 by 1024, you're just going to set that to 512 by 512, and that will give you a perfect grid that you can just go in and stitch together and hmm. use the clone tool to kind of fix up. Cool. Right, um, let's see, and actually I wonder if I have Photoshop open. Yeah, here you go, okay. So this is a repeatable texture right here, right? And let's say I'm just gonna mess it up real quick because I want to be able to repeat this, and we'll just paint this green, right? Uh, and we'll go off the edge right here so we know for sure that that's not gonna mess you know, line up, right? Yeah. If I did want that to repeat, I would go into filter, other, offset, right? I think this was 2048 by 2048 was my initial size. So I want to set it the half of that to get those grid inside. So I go 1024 by 1024. And you'll notice once I do that, you're going to see those lines, right? Because I painted off the edge. That was the edge of my document. I basically shifted it over, mm. right? So from there, I know that, okay, I just have to stitch those elements that are, you know, not exactly repeating. So I can go into, let's say, my clone tool, my clone tool, and in here you go press something like Alt, right? Grab another texture from another part of your texture, and then just come in and kind of paint over those seams, right? And the, it, really, what you want to do is start eliminating those seams. So you can come in and kind of blend this together, and that's initially how you would make a repeatable texture pretty easily, right? Hey, cool. Um, and if you have more extreme cases, right, or more extreme more things more happening, and... yeah, you, you do a lot more touch up and stuff like that. Gotcha. But yeah, use the offset function, go in, kind of fix your, your seams, you're good to go. Um, so from there, uh, if we look at this texture, right, you'll see the top of it is that repeating part right here. And the sides is this kind of rocky pattern that I have repeating around and around, right? 
Once you get a basic piece like this, I know it doesn't exactly line up on the seams right there, but that's okay. Using your artistic prowess later, you can <laughs> actually go in and fix those seams by sticking rocks on there, adding, you know, like a transparency, kind of, yeah. Yeah, like brush, whatever. Those will kind of fix, you know, those edges. Add more brush rocks on the side right here. You can really dress it up. But from this initial piece, we got this basic piece right here. I can start adding subdivisions. Right, so I go into my mesh tools, go into insert edge loop, start adding subdivisions, and then from there I can really start tweaking my piece. So if I go in and I'll just grab some things right here, I can start pulling it out. So why, why are you adding the subdivisions? So I add subdivisions so I'm able to modify um, oh. the look of my, my piece, right? And by doing that, the more subdivisions you add, and it, you know, it started as this basic kind of rectangular block, right? But from there... Kind of like joints, in a sense. Yeah, yeah and the more you add, the more smooth of a, of a line you're going to get and different things, right? Um, but from there, it gives me the ability to start tweaking those pieces to make a variety of different pieces, right? So, like I said, I'm only using that one texture, but I'm using those repeatable maps to do a variety of things. So this one, I kind of added a bunch of subdivisions and had it go around in a, in a circle, right? This one, uh, the same thing, a little platform. This one was kind of an, a snake curve I made. You can see all the little subdivisions in there, but they all started out the as, same this, as this basic uh, piece. Exactly. So from there, from one little piece, you can get a whole bunch of variety of different pieces you can use in your game. And then once you get those done and you've started creating these individual pieces, you just export them out of Unity, or I mean, I'm sorry, out of uh, Maya or Blender, whatever program you're using. Fundamentally, it's the exact same in every program. You're gonna do it, you, I would essentially create something exactly the same way I'm doing it here. But from there, export them out as FBXs, which you wanna get in the habit of doing. You can use Maya files. Um, <clears throat> or me. Blender files. Or Blender or... in Unity, yeah, you can. But the problem is, if you're working with a variety of artists, or you want people to edit it in the future, you might have problems because they might not have the software where they use like 3D Studio Max versus Maya. It's got to be installed in the machine to exactly. be able to. So you want to get in the habit of using a standard 3D format like FBX, right? I guess FBX you can consider is kind of the PNG Fact, though, yeah. of, of yeah. the 3D world, right? So from there, you export your FBX, you bring it into uh, to Unity, and then you'll be able to have all these different prefabs. And I'll go into my folder here so you can see everything I have all these different prefabs that you can start using to construct your level, right? And we can kind of see them right here on the side. So those are all the different through. FBXs that you exported from Maya. From Maya, brought them into Unity, and now I've got all these really great pieces that I can use to build my level up. Just take those, drag, drop up in your scene, and... Yep, and you know, as long as you're setting these to static, um, your draw calls, you're gonna have a major, major improvement because it's gonna batch all this together. It's only using one material and one texture, so you're gonna get massive performance gains by having all of these different pieces using one texture. When, when we talked about kind of the, the different paintbrush approach, so to say, every time that you paint a texture, think of your graphics hardware has to switch paintbrushes, and yep. it's an expensive operation. Um, and there's only a, a certain amount of time that it can do it before you start kind of getting this backlog of a batches or draw call, so to say. And so ideally you want to get as much drawn out that, that shares the same texture at one time. Now in our last MV that we did, we had about an hour and a half module yeah. on uh, optimizing your games and reducing draw calls, things like that. Check that out. But the idea is here that, that by sharing the same texture, they, uh, all those different platforms can be painted all at once with yep. one draw call. Very, very efficient. And one thing to note too, when you do bring in these 3D objects into Unity, one thing we've noticed, always make sure in your import settings, um, if you look at my screen here, you'll see on the side right here, you'll have your scale factor, which should be set in your 3D program, whatever that is. I have it set to scale factor one, which is basically the unit size of my, I'm using meters for Unity. So make sure you have it set to meters in whatever um, program you're using. Uh, but from there, you always wanna make sure that, and I don't have it set on here, but you want to click Generate Light Map UVs on each one of the objects that you bring in. And when you do that, Unity will try to figure out your UVs for you if you don't have that selected. Define what a UV is, because UV when I first started, I was like, what is a UV? Ultraviolet light? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, essentially, it is the, well, the UV space, right? It is essentially the texture space on your 3D object. Instead of like X and Y, they use U and V, right? U and V, yeah. <laughs> and it, basically, that, that just is the texture coordinates that are on your specific object. So the faces on your 3D object, you're basically mapping those to a point on a texture. Right? That's essentially what UV mapping is. Um, so from there, 
Um, yeah, you want to bring your UV, you want to bring your objects in, but make sure that generate uh, light map UVs is selected because when you do that, it's going to use the UV the UV shells that you've unwrapped on each of your your models, and you're just going to get a better result. In the, the stuff light. you've already created. Yeah, when Wait. Unity tries to figure it out for you, sometimes you're going to get weird artifacts and different things on your light might not show up right. Things might be kind of transparent at times. Yeah, and you'll and you'll notice that too if you start building a lot of your own assets and bringing them in and lighting them, you'll start seeing kind of weird artifacts when yeah. you do baking and things like that. So if you make sure that when you bring your as just a rule of thumb, I always do it, but when I use my own. Uh, UV shells and I generate light map UVs, I just get a much better result when things start getting light mapped. So just, cool. just a rule of thumb. But yeah, I mean, this is a great starting point. Um, you know, just by using this simple process, as you can see, you can get all these different pieces. And then from there, you can really start prototyping a level out, laying out the pieces how you want. Um, you know, creating custom pieces, doing whatever. And then if things need more detail, you can always go back into a piece and start adding more detail, right? Um, I always like to just kind of stick more things onto my elements. So, you know, start with a really basic kind of solid shape as your base product. And then from there, then start adding more rocks and detail and fluff and, and brush and yeah. grass and all that kind of stuff. So that's just my process, but I think it works pretty well. And cool. I'll share it with you. All right. Let's move on a little bit to a couple tips here. I just okay. want to share workflow tips. So <laughs> when I work in Unity, there's a couple things that are awesome. There's a couple things that are painful. So two real basic things that I like to do that I think will make it a little bit easier for you. And this will be posted with the code out on GitHub as well. Again, that mod, that, that URL will come on the uh, the next one. Oh, and a good point too. When we do upload this project to GitHub, uh -huh. uh, those FBI files are there for you. So take a look at them in your 3D program, bring them in, see exactly how I stretch my UVs and repeated things. It's really going to give you a good idea on how to create these. Drag, things. drop, fuel to reuse, fuel to take, take, Absolutely. Our content and reuse it however yeah, you want. Yeah, uh, however you want. Reskin yep. it, make your own textures, whatever. Um, As part of publicly putting out their own GitHub, it's it's now available to the world. So exactly. Take advantage of that. Now, right. when uh, <laughs> over over here, let me close this Vamp Kid project out and go to my desktop. And you'll notice when you open a Unity project, you actually have to point it to a folder. So if I open up Unity here. And it says, hey, what project am I going to use? If I say open other, you have to point it to a folder. And um, that's not a Unity project. Oops, I don't want to drag and drop that. That's not a Unity project, that is. But I find that a lot of times like, I'll keep folders on my desktop uh, and throughout my file system and, and my, my file sharing services. And so um, there's a little register script that I use. Again, this will be posted out there for you guys that I can just literally right click and say open as Unity project on any folder. Uh, I use this probably 30 times a day, I feel. And that will just, from a command line, spawn off Unity and pass it that folder, and it just loads up for you. Clever little addition. Clever little thing. Uh, I just got tired of doing it, so uh, just one day wrote it, and now I use it all the time. That's on your GitHub? That will be uh, that will be posted up there with this project. Okay. Uh, I'll have a little folder on there and some directions on there. It is actually on, uh, I believe that's actually on my GitHub right now. That's awesome. uh, if you go to my GitHub account, so github.com forward slash Adam Tulipper, uh, let's see here. I did post out some of that code recently because you can actually find it on my, let's see if this is listed up on here. I did a blog post on there. Let's just go right to complete development.blogspot.com. And I think it was the most recent one there. Yeah. So you can get the code there as well. I'll post it up on GitHub too. So check that out. That's really easy. That's super helpful. I never The never second really thought thing here. <laughs> it's it saves. Yeah, no, that's it awesome. seems simple, but it saves a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so hope, even if you get nothing out of today, hopefully that will <laughs> that will uh, that will be useful for you. Uh, secondly, this is another script that I got offline, and this let's go to the uh, let's go to 3D project for this one. File open project since it's in my history here. Vamp kid 3D. So right now you can't click on a on a project outside of Unity and say open in Unity. No, because there's no there's no solution file. There's no single file. It's a uh, whole folder structure that Unity needs to point it. You can open up a scene file. Yeah. It's like, but you have to navigate in so those folders, scene, double click on the click scene it, file, yeah. and then Unity will say, oh, you've opened the scene file. What project does it belong to? And then it opens it up. So this you just have to kind go. of bypasses all that from the outside. I right click on a folder. Folder. Which is my project. Your, your root folder. Open in Unity. Boom. That's Done. clever. Yeah. Nice job. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Uh, secondly, this is a script here, the second one that I found on the net, actually. Um, 
It goes in your editor folder, and it's save on play. There's an autosave script you can find out there as well. Unity does not autosave. And what this will do is any time that you are running your project, Anytime you make changes here, let's say, you know, Unity, just like any other tool, it's, it's written by software developers, and uh, we're not perfect, so you will find that things sometimes crash. It's, it's a fact of life. Uh, it will happen in, in almost any program you use for a long enough time. It's 